Hey everybody, how's it going? It's Mr. White here with Unit 5 and 6 Macroeconomics Test Review. So follow along as we go over all this information to help you get ready for the Unit 5 and 6 AP Macroeconomics Test. Okay guys, so the first thing you need to know about is the Phillips Curve. And you need to know how to draw the Phillips Curve. So let's take a look. Uh, the first thing is on your y-axis we're going to have pi. Remember pi represents the inflation rate. Then down on your x-axis, we're going to have UE, that stands for unemployment. Okay? We have the long-run Phillips curve, which is perfectly inelastic at our natural rate of unemployment, 4 to 6%. Then we've got a downward sloping short-run Phillips curve. Where these two intersect is what tells us what the rate of inflation is. And any time that we're at the intersection between long-run Phillips curve and the short-run Phillips curve, that means that our unemployment rate is between 4 to 6 percent. Okay? So here's just a couple of little things to help you just in case you forgot what all these abbreviations stand for. LRPC is our long-run Phillips curve, SRPC is our short-run Phillips curve, and the NRU is the natural rate of unemployment. It's also sometimes called the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. So if you ever see that on a test, don't be thrown off by it. Okay? NAIRU means the same thing as the NRU, natural rate of unemployment. Um, so remember that this is related to our aggregate model. So that's why I went ahead and just threw an aggregate model up there right next to our Phillips curve. The reason why is because the aggregate model and the Phillips curve are mirror images of each other. So whatever happens on the aggregate model, we're going to see the same shift but in an opposite way on the Phillips curve. Okay. So the big thing you need to know about the Phillips curve, what it's trying to show us is the relationship between inflation and unemployment. Generally, there's an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment in the short run, meaning a time period less than two years. But in the long run, the relationship between unemployment and inflation is not the same, okay? Or maybe not, not the same, but uh, in the long run, our unemployment rate is not influenced by the inflation rate. That's basically why our long run Phillips curve is perfectly inelastic at the point of our natural rate of unemployment. Okay, now with the Phillips curve, you need to know what happens when a shift occurs, okay? So like I was saying on the last slide, uh, the changes on our aggregate model are a mirror image to the changes that we see on the Phillips curve. So for example, let's think of a scenario like, for example, if the government raised personal income taxes. Um, if we're talking about personal income taxes, that means hitting individuals like you and me, and so that's gonna have an effect on consumer spending. Hopefully you remember that consumer spending is part of GDP, and so that's gonna affect aggregate demand. If taxes go up, all of us have smaller paychecks, and so we can't consume as much, and that makes our aggregate demand decrease. So it'll look just like this, like what you just saw, the shift that just occurred. Now you'll notice that our initial starting point was the white dot, but after the shift, our new equilibrium point is the yellow dot. And can you see how the yellow dot and the white dot are actually like mirror images of each other when you look at where we are on the Phillips curve compared to where we are in the aggregate model? So just remember that if we ever have a scenario where you're going to have to shift around your aggregate model, you can also determine what's going to happen on the Phillips curve by just making a mirror image of what you did on your aggregate model. Okay? So whenever this happens, when our aggregate demand falls, the price level will decrease which would mean that there's a lower rate of inflation, right? Prices won't rise as quickly. And if you look right over on our Phillips curve, we can also see that from the white dot to the yellow dot, the rate of inflation fell. The other thing that's gonna happen here is that whenever our, our real GDP falls, right? When our productivity is below the expected productivity, unemployment is gonna rise. And you'll probably notice that on our Phillips curve, the unemployment rate went above the natural rate of unemployment. So that's how you can check to make sure that you did it the right way. You should see the same kind of effects happen on both graphs, but as I said, the points on your graph are going to be mirror images of each other. Okay, so since we're going to have to know a little bit about aggregate supply and demand to be able to know about our Phillips curve, we got a little refresher on aggregate supply and demand, okay? So remember that aggregate demand tells all of the demand for all the goods and services in the United States. And so aggregate demand is influenced by the four components of GDP. Hopefully you remember the four components are consumer spending, okay, like when we buy groceries, business investment, for example, like uh, if a company built a new office building, government spending, like paying for soldiers in the military, or net exports. That means all the stuff we sell to other countries minus all the stuff we buy from other countries. 
So if we have a change to any of those things, anything that would change consumer spending, business investment, government spending, or net exports, it's going to have an effect on aggregate demand. If any of those things are increasing, aggregate demand will shift to the right. If any of those things are decreasing, aggregate demand shifts to the left. Now, aggregate supply is a different beast, okay? Aggregate supply is affected by three main things, and one of the most important is productivity and technology. Whenever we get new technology, like for example back in the 90s when we started using computers, it makes it possible for us to do more of the things we need to do. And so therefore, if we're freed up because we have better technology, like if we're freed up to do more things, we're going to produce more stuff. So generally, if you hear anything about technology or how much our workers can produce, that's going to be an effect on our SRAS. Now, the next thing is business taxes and regulations. Like for example, if you think about restaurants, they could probably produce a lot more food if they didn't have to comply with regulations from the FDA, like if they didn't have to wash their hands and keep the food at a certain temperature. I'm sure that it would be much easier to produce food and, and maybe even more efficient, but we have to have those regulations to keep all of us safe. Um, so generally, we can produce more if the regulations are not there, but as soon as we have regulations, it's going to reduce how much businesses can produce. So regulations or more taxes on businesses will have an effect on our SRAS. Now the last thing is input costs. Input cost means how much do you have to pay to create your product, if you're a business that is. And so remember that one of the biggest input costs is workers. Uh, if it says anything about workers' wages, that's going to hit our SRAS. Uh, but also things like oil. You know, oil is one of the biggest input costs for all businesses, not just oil companies. And so if you ever see a scenario that talks about oil prices changing, once again, that's going to affect our SRAS. All right. Now, looking at our aggregate model, we can use this to show economic growth. Remember that economic growth just means a sustained increase in a country's ability to produce goods and services over time. This could be caused by things like capital deepening, meaning like investing in your capital, like your machines and your factories, roads and bridges and other kinds of infrastructure, or even in your human capital, okay? Now, it could also have something to do with increasing our savings or our investment. Uh, if we save more as a country, we can invest more as a country because, of course, we know business investment depends on loans. The more we save, the more money is available to be loaned. Uh, it also is important to have a stable government that follows the rule of law, and luckily in the United States we have that. Stability and rule of law make it easier for businesses to invest, and therefore it makes it easier for the economy to grow and create new goods and services. Uh, access to technology is also key, because the more technology we have, the more things we can do. The example I always use is those two women in the African River doing laundry versus the woman in the suburbs doing laundry in a dish or in, not in a dishwasher. You don't do laundry in your dishwasher. Doing laundry in a washing machine. Uh, the lady in the suburbs in America who uses a washing machine to do laundry can be more efficient. She can get more stuff done because she doesn't have to sit there scrubbing her clothes in the river. The women in Africa who are doing their clothes in the river, not saying that they're bad at doing laundry, but they're just less efficient at doing laundry because they don't have the technology to help them. Now, the last thing is, or I should say the last two things are health and social welfare. Um, if our people aren't healthy or if their needs aren't being met, we're not going to be as productive and free trade. Uh, remember I said that free trade benefits everybody as long as it's voluntary. And so as long as we have these things, the economy can grow. The way that economic growth looks on the aggregate model is just a simple rightward shift of our LRAS. And we know that our aggregate supply and our aggregate demand will follow. So essentially the entire aggregate model just shifts to the right. Okay. So if you missed that, let me show you one more time. Let me see if I can go backwards. No, I can't go backwards. Whatever. This program is silly. Let's just keep it moving. Just remember it's a rightward shift. You got this. Okay, crowding out. Uh, crowding out is what happens when the government borrows too much money. Generally, if the government wants to increase its spending, they have to increase borrowing. This is what happens during expansionary fiscal policy. Now, when the government borrows money, they borrow a lot of money. And what that does is it causes the demand for loanable funds to increase, as you can see right here. When the demand for loanable funds increases, you can see that we're going to end up with a higher interest rate. We're going to move from R1 to R2. When interest rates are high, businesses don't want to invest because it's going to cut into their profits to pay back all that interest. Okay, So maybe a business was thinking about opening a new store, but they're not going to do that if the interest rates are too high. Okay, Now, if businesses can't open or if they can't expand and invest, the economy might still grow, but it's going to grow at a slower pace than what everybody would expect or possibly at a slower pace than what the government was hoping for.
Okay, now fiscal policy. Remember that fiscal policy is what Congress and the President of the United States do to try to stabilize fluctuations in the economy. Now, there are two different kinds of fiscal policy, expansionary and contractionary. You need to know both. Remember that expansionary fiscal policy is used to fight unemployment during a recession. So like if we were in a Great Depression or something like that, we would want to use expansionary fiscal policy. This is when we increase government spending and decrease taxes. Now, remember that when we increase government spending, that's a direct component of real GDP, and so that's going to cause our aggregate demand to increase. Now, when we talk about taxes, the only kind of taxes that would affect our aggregate demand would be personal taxes. So if the government cuts personal taxes, aggregate demand will increase. Remember that if the government is going to cut business taxes, that's going to have an effect on our SRAS, not our aggregate demand. Now, contractionary fiscal policy is the exact opposite. This is what the government uses to fight inflation during economic expansion. Remember that during an expansion phase, the scary thing is that prices are rising because there's so much demand for goods and services in the economy. So to slow down the demand for goods and services and therefore keep prices down, the government is going to decrease spending. They're not going to spend as much because that's increasing the spending uh, that leads to more inflation. And so when they lower their uh, spending, then what happens is aggregate demand also goes down because government spending is a direct component of aggregate demand. Now, if they increase taxes, like I said, it depends on if they're increasing personal taxes or business taxes. If they increase personal taxes, then aggregate demand will decrease. But if they increase business taxes, then short run aggregate supply would decrease. All right, next up the types of fiscal policy. So we said that there's expansionary and contractionary, but we can also have what's known as automatic and discretionary fiscal policy. Automatic fiscal policy means that the government does not have to pass any laws for their fiscal policy to take effect. So the changes to government spending or taxes only happen because of a fluctuation in the economy. And so therefore the fiscal policy that we need will happen automatically. A great example could be like unemployment insurance or our progressive income tax structure. Unemployment insurance is given out to people who lose their job through no fault of their own. Generally that happens because of layoffs and layoffs happen when the economy is doing badly. So if the economy is doing badly and more people are losing their jobs, more people will qualify for unemployment insurance and therefore the government is going to have to increase how much it spends on unemployment program. Now, Progressive income taxes are taxes that change based on how much money people make. So if we're in a contraction phase of the business cycle, then people are making less money. And so therefore automatically their taxes are going to go down. But if we're in an expansion phase of the business cycle and everybody's making a lot of money, then automatically their taxes are going to go up. The cool thing about this is the government doesn't have to do a thing. It's just going to take place automatically because of laws that were passed many, many years ago. Now, discretionary fiscal policy is different. This is the kind of fiscal policy where Congress actually has to agree on something and pass a law. I don't know if you guys have paid much attention to Congress over the last couple of years, but they pretty much don't agree on anything. And passing laws is really hard for them to do. So when they change government spending or taxes based on their legislative agenda of, of whatever party happens to be in power, that's discretionary fiscal policy. Now, the problem with discretionary fiscal policy is it tends to be really slow to take effect. And of course, it's subject to political fighting and of course, political ideology. So it's not always good for the economy. Um, in the long term, if we're trying to solve like really big problems with our economy, we might need discretionary fiscal policy to do that. But most economists agree that for your short term, little fluctuations of the business cycle, monetary policy actually tends to be a lot more effective than discretionary fiscal policy. Okay, speaking of monetary policy, let's talk about the Fed. Remember that the Fed re refers to the Federal Reserve Bank. They're not the government. They're a, a separate entity that is connected to the government, but not under the control of the government. And the Fed essentially is in charge of our money and our banking system. So there are some things they can do to try to stimulate the economy if we're struggling. Okay, uh, The first thing the Fed can do to stabilize the economy is what's called open market operations. Open market operations is when the Fed buys or sells government securities, aka bonds, to try to increase or decrease the money supply. Increasing the money supply is expansionary. It's what we would do during a contraction of the business cycle. Decreasing the money supply is contractionary. 
It's what we do during the expansion phase if we're worried about inflation. So you might be asking yourself, well, how do we know which is which? Well, when the Fed wants the money supply to get bigger, they will buy bonds. But if the Fed wants the money supply to be smaller, they will sell bonds. So remember that open market operations are is the most powerful tool the Fed has, and it's the tool that they're most likely to use if they need to stabilize the economy. Now, the second most likely tool that they will use is manipulating the discount rate. The discount rate refers to the interest rate that the Federal Reserve charges banks when they want to borrow money. Sometimes the banks need to borrow money because they need to cover their reserve requirement. And so if they can't get a loan from another bank, the Fed is the lender of last resort. Now, if the discount rate is low, that means the interest rate that banks have to pay is low. And therefore, they're going to borrow more. If it's easy for banks to borrow money, then it's going to be easy for all of us to borrow money. And therefore, it's going to be easier for money to flow out into the economy. This is what we would sometimes call an easy money policy, right? Basically making it easier for everybody to get money. And when it's easy for everybody to get money, everybody's going to spend money. That's expansionary. The opposite of that is if we have a high discount rate. With a high discount rate, all the opposite stuff happens, right? With a high discount rate, it's harder for banks to borrow. If it's harder for banks to borrow, it's harder for you and me to borrow money too. And therefore, we can't spend money on big purchase items like cars or houses or college tuition. And in that way, aggregate demand would fall. Remember, that's aimed at keeping inflation under control. Now, the last tool that's in their toolbox, they don't like to use it very much. As a matter of fact, they haven't touched it in almost 25 years. That's the reserve requirement ratio. This is the percentage of demand deposits that have to be held in reserve and cannot be loaned out by banks. So when you go put your money in your checking account, remember that the, the bank actually has to save a portion of that, and then the rest of it they can loan out. Remember, currently right now it's 10%. So the lower that that reserve requirement ratio is, the more money the bank is free to lend out. And remember, that increases that thing called the deposit expansion multiplier. The lower that reserve requirement is, the more money the banks can create. When the reserve requirement ratio is really high, the banks can't lend as much, and so our deposit expansion multiplier becomes much smaller, and the banks have a much harder time creating money. So all three of these tools, open market operations, discount rate, and the reserve requirement ratio are all the tools that the Fed has to either increase or decrease the money supply, which will help stabilize the economy. Now, like I said, two terms that you need to know with regard to the Fed and monetary policy are tight money and loose money. Tight money means a contractionary policy where the Fed wants it to be hard for people to get money so that they can keep inflation under control. Loose money means the Fed wants it to be really easy for everybody to get money so that everybody can spend money and try to reduce the unemployment rate and get us out of a recession. Now, uh, one thing we haven't talked about much, but it was in the readings you were supposed to be doing, is the theory of rational expectations. Okay? This refers to the idea that people make choices based on their rational outlook their available information, and of course their past experiences. Okay, So all of us have different expectations about what's going to happen. and Most of the time the reason why we have these expectations is because we're trying to look out for ourselves and make ourselves better off down the road. Now because of this, current expectations in the economy are equivalent to what people think the future state of the economy is going to become. So in other words, if the economy is doing really bad right now, most people believe that that bad economy is going to persist. So this can interfere with fiscal and monetary policy because even if the government decides to do something like cut your taxes, if you believe that the economy is going to continue to get worse, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to use that extra money to go buy more stuff. As a matter of fact, a lot of people, because of their rational expectations, will save more money. And remember that if people save more money, this whole economic problem that we're trying to fix doesn't actually get fixed. And so that's the danger of rational expectations. All of us are trying to make ourselves better off, and sometimes our expectations can actually get in the way of our fiscal and monetary policy. Now, imports and exports, deficits and surpluses. Let's just real quick go over what all that stuff means. Hopefully, you remember that an export means a good or a service that's sent out of a country. So the way I always remember it is that exports are things that exit our country. Imports are the exact opposite. Imports are goods or services that are brought into our country from abroad. So remember that imports with an I come in. Now, if you're in a situation where your exports are greater than your imports, we call that a trade surplus, okay? But if your imports are greater than your exports, we would call that a trade deficit. 
Remember that currently the United States has a trade deficit with the rest of the world because we import more goods and services from outside than we export. Now, we, locked, we talked a lot about currency supply and demand. Remember that this tells us how the value of currencies, or we should say the exchange rate between two currencies will fluctuate based on the trade that they have with each other. So this shows the supply and demand of currencies not in our own countries, but rather on that thing called the international currency market. Now, two terms you would need to know are appreciation and depreciation. Appreciation means the value of your money is rising, whereas depreciation means the value of your money is falling. So this is the one where we have to draw those two supply and demand graphs right next to each other. So what you see here is we've got the real market, and this is like in Brazil. Brazil has a kind of money called the real. And we've got the dollar market over here. So perhaps it used to take 50 cents to equal one real or two real to equal one dollar. And that's what we see on the y-axis of each graph. You see it says dollar price of real and real price of US dollars. Now, what happens is if one currency shifts, like as you can see in this example, the demand of real shifted to the right. This would occur because Americans want to buy stuff from Brazil. In order to buy stuff from Brazil, we need Brazilian money, Brazilian real. So we have to demand that money from the international currency market. Now, we can demand the money out of the currency market, but in exchange, we have to put some of our own money into the currency market. That's why the supply of dollars on the graph right next to the real market, you see the supply of dollars is shifting to the right, indicating that the supply of dollars on the international market is increasing. So step one, if you shift supply of one graph, you have to shift demand of the other graph. Step two, you see how both lines have to move in the same direction. So my real demand moved to the right and my dollar supply moved to the right. Now you'll notice that when this happens, one currency will always appreciate and the other currency will always depreciate. In this example, after the demand for reals increased, instead of taking 50 US cents to get one real, now it takes 67 US cents to get one real. And instead of taking two real to get one dollar, now it only takes 150 real to equal one dollar. So we can say that the real has appreciated and the dollar has depreciated. Now, for this to happen, there's different determinants. And we talked about these in class, but let's run through them one more time. The first determinant is what's called the fad effect. The fad effect tells us that if products from abroad are popular domestically, like in our country, we're gonna import more goods and services from abroad. To do that, we have to supply our currency and demand the other country's currency in return. So in a situation where we're buying more products from Japan, we'll supply more dollars to the international currency market so that we can demand more Japanese yen. Now, the interest rate effect is next. That says that if interest rates are higher domestically, foreigners are going to move their money into our banks to take advantage of higher returns. So in that situation, let's say if the United States had a higher interest rate than Germany, we're going to see Germans supplying their currency to the international currency market in order to demand our currency in return. That way they can invest and get higher interest rates. Now, the inflation effect also has a big impact on currency supply and demand. If one country has a higher inflation rate than other countries, then the people in our country with the high inflation rate are going to seek to protect the purchasing power of our money by converting it into some other kind of currency. In other words, if the value of the dollar is dropping, you should convert your dollars into euros so that you don't lose purchasing power. So in order to do that, you have to supply dollars to the international currency market and demand euros out in exchange, okay? Now, the expectations effect also plays a role. Remember, we said that uh, expectations can cause people to do different things that can affect the economy. So if foreign investors expect that our country has great potential for economic growth, then what they're gonna wanna do is move their money into our currency so that they can invest in our domestic industries and take advantage of that growth. Now. In this situation, the foreigners would be supplying their currency into, our, uh, into the international currency market so that they can demand our currency in return and invest. Now, the expansion or contraction effect is next. That says that if a country is experiencing an economic expansion, then they're going to demand more imports from abroad. But if a country is experiencing an economic contraction, 
they're not going to demand as many imports from abroad. So generally, if we uh, have an expansion here, everybody's got more money, we're going to demand more expensive foreign imports like Louis Vuitton purses and Ferraris. But if our economy is doing badly, nobody's buying those things, right? So our demand for imports will go down. Last thing is the purchasing power parity effect or the PPP effect. That tells us that if another nation's currency is weak relative to our own, we're going to demand more imports from that country. So, for example, uh, right now, America's money is stronger than China's money. And for that reason, we demand a lot of imports from China. But China doesn't demand a lot of imports from us because our money is more valuable. Instead, China might demand more imports from Japan because China's money is stronger than Japan's money. So to people in China, Japanese products would look relatively cheap. Okay. Now, one last little thing. You need to know a couple terms here. The term capital flight, that means the same thing as capital outflows, meaning that currency is leaving your country. Capital inflows are the opposite. That means money is coming into your country from somewhere else in the world. So just keep those in mind. You will see these terms capital flight and capital inflows on the test. Okay. Now, uh, absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Remember, these are the things you need to know in order to determine whether or not countries should trade with each other, and if they should trade, what should the terms of trade be? Now, absolute advantage means the ability to produce more of a good or service than anybody else. So for example, if Japan can make 100 computers per day and the US makes 95 computers per day, we would say that Japan has an absolute advantage in the production of computers, simply because they can make more. But when it comes to comparative advantage, it's a little bit more nuanced. Comparative advantage means that we have the ability to produce a good or service for a lower opportunity cost than anybody else. So if it costs Japan 100 computers to make one truck, and it costs the USA 75 computers to make one truck, we would say the USA has a comparative advantage in the production of trucks. Okay, so for finding comparative advantage, remember you have to do a little bit of math, and it all depends on uh, what kind of information you're presented with. Now, there's two different kinds of ways to find comparative advantage, the input method and the output method. So let's do the input method first. The input method means that the problem we're presented with is asking how many inputs does each country need to get a, sp a specific amount of output. So in these kind of problems, it's the inputs that vary, meaning the resources or time that we have to put in. So in this particular example, between France and Germany, you can see that it takes France three hours to make one car. It takes Germany four hours to make one car. So the number of cars is the same, but the number of hours they put in is different. It takes France nine hours to make one truck and eight hours in Germany to make one truck. So the number of trucks they get is the same, but the number of hours that they put in is different. So whenever it's an input problem like this one, we say IOU, input other under. So if we want to know the opportunity cost of making one truck, we take the other thing, which is cars, and we put it under. So nine divided by three. So that tells us the opportunity cost of creating one truck is that we're sacrificing three cars. Okay, now that's in France. Do the same thing for Germany, right? Eight divided by four is two. So that means that every time Germany makes one truck, they're sacrificing two cars. What you want to do is look for the number that's smaller. The number that's smaller means that they have a smaller opportunity cost, and therefore they have the comparative advantage. So in this scenario, we can see that two is smaller than three, and so Germany has a comparative advantage at making trucks. Now we'll do the same thing on the other side, right? Input other under. So we would say three divided by nine, which is 0.33, or eight divided, or sorry, four divided by eight, which is 0.5. Now, 0.33 is less than 0.5, so we would say that France has a comparative advantage at making cars. The reason why is that they give up fewer trucks, only a third of a truck, every time they make a car, compared to Germany, who gives up half of a truck every time they make a car. So once we've identified who has the comparative advantage, we can say what each country should specialize in. France should specialize in making cars because their opportunity cost of making a car, 0.33, is lower than Germany. Germany should specialize in making trucks because their opportunity cost, two, is lower than France, okay? Now, when we're trying to find the terms of trade, what you wanna do is just identify a number that falls in between the opportunity cost of both parties. I like to look on the side that has whole numbers, not decimals. So I would look right over here where we've got trucks, okay? Because you can see that we've got three and we've got two. Okay, so those are nice whole numbers. So we just need a number that's in between three and two. So 
for the terms of trade, we could say that a truck is worth between two to three cars, okay? So if we were gonna do trade between France and Germany, they could trade one truck for two and a half cars, one truck for 2.59999 cars, one truck for 2.2 cars, one truck for 2.1 cars, one truck for 2.99999999 cars, right? Any number that falls between two and three for one truck would make both sides better off. Okay, now, another example of uh, comparative advantage in terms of trade is the input, or sorry, me, huh, you can tell it's late on in a Friday, guys, the output method. <laughs> okay, the output method of finding comparative advantage. This is where we see a problem where we're seeing how much output each country gets from a fixed amount of inputs. In other words, it's the number of stuff that we create that varies, not the amount of time or resources that we need to put in. So in this example, you can see we've got Honduras and El Salvador. Honduras can make four hats per day. El Salvador can make 15. Honduras can make 20 shoes per day. El Salvador can make 30. So you see how per day is the same, but the amount of stuff we get per day is different. That's how we know it's output. And whenever it's output, we say output other over. So what I'm going to do in this situation is I'm going to take hats and put it over shoes, right? So 4 divided by 20. 4 divided by 20 is 0.2. Then I would say hats over shoes for El Salvador, 15 divided by 30, which is 0.5, okay? 0.2 is less than 0.5, so we would say that Honduras has a comparative advantage at making shoes, okay? Now, uh, we'll do the same thing on the other side, right? Output other over, so 20 divided by 4, which is 5, or 30 divided by 15, which is 2. In this situation, El Salvador, with an opportunity cost of 2, has a lower opportunity cost than Honduras, which their opportunity cost is 5. So we would say that El Salvador has a comparative advantage at producing hats. So, since Honduras has a comparative advantage in making shoes, they should specialize in making shoes because their opportunity cost is lower than El Salvador, meaning that they give up fewer hats per day to make shoes than El Salvador does. So that means Honduras is only going to make shoes. Um, El Salvador should make hats because their opportunity cost is lower than Honduras. El Salvador only gives up two pairs of shoes every time they make a hat, whereas Honduras gives up five. So in this scenario, El Salvador is just going to make hats, Honduras is just going to make shoes, and then at the end of the day, they can trade with each other. Like I said, look at where they got those nice whole numbers, five and two, and what we want to say is that one hat is worth anywhere between two to five pairs of shoes. Those would be our terms of trade. That would make both sides better off. So we could trade one hat for three pairs of shoes. We could trade one hat for four pairs of shoes, one hat for 4.999 pairs of shoes, any number that falls in between two and five will trade perfectly for one half. Okay, so next up is stagflation. We've talked about this a lot, guys. Hopefully you remember that stagflation just means the combination of high unemployment and high inflation at the same time. Now, if we were to put our aggregate model and a Phillips curve next to each other, it would look something like this. Generally, stagflation is always going to be caused by a leftward shift of our short-run aggregate supply. This is caused by like less productivity, um, you know, if our workers are not producing as much for some reason, um, increasing input costs, for example, if businesses have to pay their workers more, or if resources go up in price, like for example, if oil went up in price, uh, and also things like more business taxes and regulations. Generally, when that happens, our productivity falls. That's why we went from YF to Y2. Less productivity means more unemployment. And the really nasty thing about this is it also causes our price level to rise. So the CPI is going to go up. So you see on our Phillips curve, we have a similar kind of thing going on because we shifted from short run Phillips curve one to short run Phillips curve two. When that happened, our rate of inflation went up from pi one to pi two. And you'll also see that our unemployment rate is now to the right of our natural rate of unemployment. So unemployment is higher than the natural rate of four to six percent. So generally stagflation is like the worst possible scenario for our economy. Nobody likes it when stagflation happens. Now expectations play a big role in the economy. We've talked a lot about this over and over again, but they especially are important for the Phillips curve, okay? Now, we had that one worksheet where you saw the Phillips curve that looks like this. You know, we've got three short run Phillips curves and we've got one long run Phillips curve. And you'll see that they intersect the long run Phillips curve at different rates of inflation. Now, when the expectation of inflation changes, the short run Phillips curve will shift around. That's how we get these different short run Phillips curves. So, 
When expected inflation matches actual inflation, we are at long run equilibrium on our Phillips curve. That would be any of the points on this particular graph like point B, point E, or point H. All of those Phillips curves represent people's expectations of inflation. So at point H, everybody's expecting 5% inflation. At point E, everybody's expecting 10% inflation. And at point B, everybody's expecting 15% inflation. Now, the curves that are connected to those points also represent the same expectation of inflation. So, if the expectation of inflation is lower than what the actual rate of inflation is, we would be at a point to the left of our long run Phillips curve. Points like A, D, and G. You'll notice that A, D, and G are on lines that are connected to H, E, and B. So, line H represents 5% inflation. So if we're at point G, we expect 5% inflation, but we're actually getting 10%. At point D, we're expecting 10% inflation, but we're actually getting 15%. Now, when the expectation of inflation is higher than the actual inflation rate, we would be at a point to the right of our long run Phillips curve, a point like C. At point C, we expect 15% inflation, but we're actually getting 10%, or point F. At point F, we expect 10% inflation, but we're actually getting 5%, okay? So just remember that these curves um, are created because our expectations of inflation have changed. All right, so next up, we've got the balance of payments. This is the last thing we studied in this unit. Remember that the balance of payments just refers to the sum of all the transactions that take place between a country's residents and the residents of all other foreign nations. So this would include things like imports and exports, buying property, uh, financial investments, foreign aid. There's a ton of stuff, but anytime money moves between our country and another country, it needs to be recorded in our balance of payments. So the first account in our balance of payments is called the current account. That includes all of our net exports, meaning exports minus imports, our net foreign income, which is interest earned or paid on foreign investments, and net transfers, money that's sent abroad from our people. And this tends to be a unilateral thing, like when you send money to your parents who live in Guatemala, um, your parents in Guatemala probably aren't sending anything back. It's just a one-way transfer of money. Now, the next account is called the capital or financial account. This records all the physical and financial capital ownership that takes place between two countries. So uh, if foreigners invest capital in the United States, like if a foreigner came to the United States and built a factory, that would be foreign direct investment in the US. Whereas if an American firm went out and built a factory in another country, that would be American investment in a foreign country. All that's recorded in our capital or financial account. And last of all, we've got the US official reserves account. This is foreign currency that's held in reserve by the Fed, and it's basically just used to offset trade deficits and surpluses and to allow us to have trade with the rest of the world. So please make sure you know all three accounts, current account, capital account, and U.S. official reserves. If you need more info on this, just check the notes on Edmodo. Okay, guys, so last up is the short answer. And uh, as always, we're going to have two little short answer questions at the end of our test. They're going to be worth 10 points. Generally, I don't ever talk about those on the test review, but I figured I'd give you guys a little bonus for watching all the way to the end of the video and, of course, for studying for your tests. So here's what you need to be aware of to be able to do well on the short answer. First of all, you absolutely have to know how to calculate comparative advantage in the terms of trade. That was the stuff that we talked about with, you know, output other over or input other under. You absolutely have to know that. And you really should bring a calculator on Monday um, or whatever day your test is, right? Bring a calculator. The reason why you need to bring a calculator is because you probably won't be able to do the math in your head for the question that I ask you on the test. So it's better to have your own calculator instead of having to try to borrow one or share one with somebody else, okay? The second short answer question that you're gonna to need to answer requires you to know how to draw the Phillips curve and the aggregate model. So please guys, please make sure you know how to draw a Phillips curve and make sure you know how to draw the aggregate model. If you don't know how to do those yet guys, please practice over the weekend. I don't want you coming in here drawing some weird off the wall graph that has nothing to do with the Phillips curve and the aggregate model, okay? Um, be prepared to show how both graphs will change if something occurs in the economy, like if there's a change to fiscal or monetary policy, or if there's a change to some other factor in the economy. Remember how they're mirror images of each other. So I'm gonna be looking for that mirror image shift, okay? That's about it, guys. You know, So you need to make sure you study for your test.
Uh, make sure you come in here prepared to do a great job because this is the last test of the semester. Of course, if you have any questions, just go ahead and shoot me an email or shoot me a remind and I'll be happy to help you. Otherwise, good luck on your test.